as a business owner, you take risks all the time. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. This week I am speaking with Brian Masana. So Brian founded New York City-based architectural firm Masana O'Rourke with Toby O'Rourke in 1996. And since then they've developed an extraordinary portfolio of work in residential, commercial, retail, and conceptual projects. The firm is anticipating their first monograph, Masana O'Rourke, Building Blocks, with text by Maya Russ and a forward by Thomas Pfeiffer, which is gonna be published by Rosoli this October and is gonna be showcasing 25 of their projects that represents the firm's legacy. Now, this was a really wonderful conversation and a, and a real delight to speak with Brian as he sat in uh, his beautiful apartment, the Jewel Box, which is one of their projects that you can see featured on, on their website. Um, and Brian spoke very authentically in this conversation about how the practice has been grown and developed. Some of the topics that we discussed included how to sustain a long lasting business relationship. So Brian spoke um, at length about that. The importance of taking risk in business and in your design and how to guide your clients through their own risks that they're taking with their projects. And we spoke about getting published, the importance of getting published, the importance of fantastic photography, and the difference between DIY publications and using PRs. So this was a superb conversation, um, thoroughly enjoyed it. So sit back, relax and enjoy Brian Masana. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Brian, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Well, thank you very much for getting up so early to accommodate uh, the time zones here. I know it's what 7, 7 a.m. there for you. Or half seven, seven, just to half seven. Seven thirty, and you're in. And but we get the, the the privilege of being in one of your beautiful projects. This is the jewel box. <laughs> thank, thank you. Yes, this is the jewel box. Happens to be my apartment as well. Very nice. Very nice. Um, so you are one of the principals and co-founders of Masana O'Rourke. Um, you and your business partner, Toby, founded the business back in 1996. Um, I understand Toby is Scottish? Yeah, or- uh, Scottish, English. Yeah, he's... Uh, he's, in- he's-, he's in- He's from this he's, part of the world. He's from that part of the world. His, I mean, his his mother lives in Jedburgh on the borders of Scotland and England. Um, right, lovely. Yeah. Great. Beautiful, and beautiful so, part of the world. And so how did you guys meet and set up the practice? So we met in 1987, I think it was now. Uh, I'm getting, I'm showing my age. Um, we so we met at university i was i was studying at the virginia tech in alexandria virginia and it was a consortium of about i think five schools and each school sent about 15 students each to that school including at that time it was called uh oxford poly um and toby toby came in second semester starting in January. And uh, that's where I met. Actually, that's where I met. It was a good good uh, place to be because you met a lot of people. I'm, I'm originally from the West Coast. Uh, I had just gotten back from my first trip to Europe where I studied mm-hmm. at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts during the summer. And uh, so it was amazing kind of to meet all these people from different parts of the United States and then also um students from oxford poly so it it wasn't long after then university that you guys decided to create the business was there a project that was a catalyst for that or was it something that during studying you you knew that you wanted to kind of go straight into business uh well 
I always knew that I wanted to open up an office uh, at some point in my career. And my father was an interior designer for, I don't know, had his own business for like maybe 40 years, something like mm-hmm. that. And uh, I, I was fascinated by architecture since I was uh, probably eight and had always dreamt of opening up a firm. And I was working for the architect, Peter Marino, and a good friend of mine who I met uh, at Rich Meyer Partners called me up. She was working for the uh, for Donna Karen, and she was the assistant to the creative director Trey Laird. And she said, "Oh, you know, we may have some um, moonlight work for you." And uh, I said, "Sure, I'll come in." So I, I walked in one evening, and I walked out with a full store to to design in Santiago, Chile. And you know, to be frank, I did not enjoy working at Peter Marino's office. I was there for six weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, I received this project, which was a large project and a good fee. And uh, you know, I, I walked in the next day and I quit. And <laughs> that's that's how Masano work started. Uh, Toby was working for Polo Ralph Lauren uh, Store Design, mm-hmm. and he. Uh, worked with me, but was still working full time simultaneously uh, with them for the first year. Yep. And um, we, you know, it was a, it was a really, we came in uh, at a really good time, you know, timing, uh, you know, they always say timing is uh, really critical uh, or it's all about timing. And it's so true. Um when I walked in and walked out with the project, they were in the process of really bulking up their um, their portfolio of stores, and mm-hmm. they were getting ready to go for their IPO. So we designed, I think, about twenty some projects for them in eighteen months. Wow! And that that ranged from stores around the world to their showroom in New York, the showroom in Milan, Shop and Shops, and Harvey Nichols. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a really, it was a really great experience because it was the first time. Well, first of all, it's very New York, right? So back, this is pre nine nine eleven. So right. you could walk into any office, office building, uh, knock on the door, and uh, get uh, get to the front desk. And uh, so I met a lot of fashion people. It was very interesting, and exciting for me. It was the first time I. I heard of and understood what the role of a creative director was. Mm-hmm. So it, it was great. It was a good experience. So, that, so that's a, a very interesting kind of start to a, a business. And you've kind of continued on working with a lot of, a lot of retail and high-end um, fashion stores. When did, you st- when did kind of residential and hospitality types of projects start to emerge? And what was the kind of initial growth strategy at the beginning? growth strategy strategy that's a strategy that's a interesting word that i use but never figured out how to actually implement it uh so at the end of about 18 to 19 months donna karen the work dropped off and Mm -hmm. uh there was a very scary time for us Uh, you know there was lots of work lots of activity (laughs) lots of fees and uh, that kind of came to a stop. And it was our first residential project we actually did for free. Um, and that was because we had many, many potential clients come into the office and for residential projects, and they loved our work, but they couldn't see in our portfolio an apartment or a house. Mm. So we invested time into uh, a project that we did for free, and uh, it came out beautifully. It was photographed, published on the cover of magazines, and boom, there there began our foray into residential work. Now, so so that that's always a big risk taking on a project without any fees. But not having having the confidence that you were going to be able to market it, and it would be a, a loss leader in that sense. Um, when you were making that decision, how were you? What were the sorts of things that had you feel confident to take it on, and that it would work? 
I had no preconceived ideas that it was going to work. Uh, there was we didn't really have a choice. Uh, so I guess I kind of listen. It's not really the the long term. It's not. It's a strategy that doesn't really work long term, right? Sure. How, however, when you look at the duration of your or, or the current life life cycle of your practice, and understand there's you know there's fees coming in, there's costs that you have to uh, take care of. You realize that sometimes sometimes marketing comes in different ways. So mm. for example, I, we attribute, we, we looked at that pro bono work, let's say uh, as something that we are investing in marketing as a, so instead of p hiring a PR agent or someone or doing something that was towards marketing, this was a very specific project um, that had the potential or could potentially be a project that could take us to that next level. Mm -hmm. at, at minimum, we would have a residential project for the first time. So for, for us, that was the goal. Um, it, it, it turned out really well, obviously, that it was photographed and published and on covers in several magazines. Um, but as a business owner, you take risks all the time. I, yeah. I, I, I take risks all the time. Uh, you know, people sometimes, I, I know that I've, my mother said, you know, do you want to go to Las, meet us in Las Vegas or something like that and, and play. And they don't even really gamble. I really, but, um, I said, no, you know, I, I gamble every day. Like every day is a risk, you know, cause I, I, we, whether it's, it's trying to get new work, trying to push our design, it, it's, we're always risking. Um, something. Mm. What 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 other kinds of risks would you say that you've that you've taken in business or that have been that have really paid off? I don't know. You know, uh, this is probably too early in the podcast, but we are Rizzoli is just publishing our book, and the, the, the first uh, uh, the first monograph, right? First monograph, and uh, I would say that. 26 years of taking risks has given us that opportunity uh, to, to somehow produce a body of work that was, that is, uh, that is worthy of a book. Um, mm. Yeah. Uh, right. So I don't mean to be vague, but uh, there's, I, I mean, literally like uh, I, we take risks all the time. Uh, and that's, you know, so I remember one client, we uh, early on in our career uh, for skincare lab, um, one of our very early projects for a day spa, and we were walking down this main corridor, which is has two large existing columns that's very reminiscent or is uh, uh, um, reminiscent of a light industrial building in New York City, and on the other side was is a stainless steel wall. That's every three feet, there's an indentation and there's a recessed vertical fluorescent light fixture. And the client said to us, like, as we're walking down this, oh, God, it's beautiful. Did you, did you think it would be this beautiful? And I said, well, or had you done it before? And I said, no, we've never done this before. Like, I assumed it was going to be beautiful, but, you know, it's, it's one thing to draw it. It's one thing to model it, but mm -hmm. to actually have it built is something else. And uh, most of the time we are pleasantly surprised yeah. uh, uh, and uh, even more surprised or happy when our clients get it. It's, it's a very interesting conversation about risk in business and perhaps one that we're not, we don't always talk about. Um, how do you, so when you're taking a risk, say in the design, how do you put a client at ease for them to be able to take a risk, because if you're taking a risk with the design, the client is also taking a risk and they might not always be as, you know, wanting to take a risk as, as you as the architects are. How do you kind of create and balance and harmonize that tension? Tension. Wow. Uh, yeah. It really depends on the client and the project. Sometimes we don't even talk about the risk. 
uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, so we're, we're 26 years old now. So there's, I, I think that our clients with that experience comes trust when your client comes to you. So there's a certain degree of trust that each client has uh, and faith that you are going to produce something that is exciting. At the same time, sometimes clients, some clients like, oh, you know, I, I got the burger last time with the pickles, the onions, the mayo, and um, I love that. So can you give me the same thing? Yeah. And it's like, well, that's not what we do. Like, I'm, I'm not going to give you the same thing I get gave to the last customer. Uh, so sometimes it, being a business uh, and being an architect, because nothing is ever the same, mm-hmm. it's, it is very exciting, very frustrating, so many things. You know, we're not, I'm not, we're not producing a car um, that you spend, you know, millions and millions of dollars in production or in research, and then it finally comes out, and then you're just producing one after the other. You know, every every time you try to make a better mousetrap, there is something new that you have to deal mm. with, and so every single project is is new. I, I guess every project that we take on is a risk, particularly if it's with a new client. And we know the problems that can emerge when we take on the project that's not the right fit, because um, that can be incredibly expensive. The project doesn't go the way that it goes. In the, in the 26 years of, of running a business, how have you refined your process? Or how do you know when it's the right client? And how do you know when to say no? Well, you know, I'll add to that, you know, if it's the wrong client and wrong project, especially when you're a small business and we're a small business, it is, it really affects the entire office. Uh, I mean, Toby and I are very passionate about what we do and uh, it's, we're not, we're not businessmen. We're not like dollars and cents. We, you know, calculate everything and um, that's how we determine whether or not a project is successful. So when i mean even that goes when we have a great client and a great project and we're we're like it's not clicking the the project's not clicking you're just like you're doing it and doing it and doing it every night you go like i don't understand why is this not clicking this it's it's very frustrating so Mm -hmm. we know in most cases we know either the temperament of the client or the project type or the budget or the the schedule uh, may not work, and sometimes we'll take a risk and 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 engage with the the, the client. And sometimes it's amazing, and if once in a blue moon, it's uh, it's not a good experience. Got it. Did um, I did I did I answer that question? Sort of, and, and I, I I guess when do you, do you have any red flags? Maybe that's another way of looking at what kind of red flags would come up in an interview stage with a client. And you're like, you know what, we're going to pass on this one. Or Uh, there's several red flags, (laughs) several red flags. Number one is, Oh, we really, I I like, I like your work, but it's not, it's not, I don't really, and they start describing like, Oh, I don't really like this, 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 and that. And then you go, well, what, why are you coming to us? Uh, so that's a red flag. Schedule, especially during COVID. COVID has been, you know, extremely challenging. And when a client comes in with a very specific schedule, it, it's I can tell like that project is going to be very intense schedule wise, and every day is going to be a challenge. Mm. So that's when we would avoid that project. Um, budget, you know, th- we've learned over the years that budgets fluctuate, that uh, no client comes in with a budget that is really in line with what they want. Mm-hmm. So it's just, deter- it's, it's a process of educating them in terms of, 
what what we are producing in terms of design and what monetary value the current economy places on that. Uh, and I yeah. say that because during COVID that was you know very real and uh, ever changing. You spoke earlier, you know, the, the first few projects back in 97 or the late, late nineties. And then obviously mm -hmm. we had nine 11, then there's been 2008 and more recently we've had COVID. So your business is mature enough, if you like, that it's weathered a number of these economic mm -hmm. difficulties or storms. Mm -hmm. What have been some of the main things that you've learned about running a business from those experiences and, and what's enabled you guys to prosper or continue? Prosper. Continue is a better word. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Uh, tw you know, 2008 was, I think two 2008 was the most devastating, actually. I remember 2008 so vividly because Toby and I were actually flying we were flying to Italy via the UK to stay with some friends. And it was the day that Lehman Brothers oh, folded. And I remember getting off the plane in, was it Florence? Uh, not Florence, um, Pisa. And turning my phone on and, you know, boop, 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 boop. And it's like, oh my God, what is going on? And, most of our clients were bankers and most of those clients, like we had to cancel projects, et cetera. It was, uh, that was, that was really, a, yeah, very devastating. And I remember, mm. uh, shifting, uh, I think f financially that was the most devastating time in our career. And mm. I know that, that COVID, COVID, I think, you know, I'm not the only one, but obviously it affected us in many different ways. And, uh, I think that we value and appreciate what we do even more and also appreciate our time even more mm. and that our time is, is valuable. Uh, and I don't mean that in terms of necessarily for design, but just valuable in life. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. In 2008, when lots of those projects were kind of being put on hold or completely cancelled, did it mean that you then had to reduce the team size or how did you kind of turn things around? Or So what it meant was uh, that simultaneously, I think it, was, it wasn't 2008, it was 2009, 2010. Right. Um, because 2008 was when clients in sort of mid sentence were dropping off, but we had projects already in the pipeline. And, uh, so we lasted until about 2010 at our current, at our then office. And coincidentally, we were subleasing a space within a larger space and the, our landlord was going to move out. And we decided we were going to move to another location and we were just about to sign a lease in this beautiful building, beautiful space. And I remember so vividly telling Toby, like, you know, we could sign this lease, invest money in renovating it, et cetera. Um, but we had never, we have never experienced such uh, collateral damage in terms of, you know, loss of clients, et cetera. Or I said, we could pack up everything, move most of it to, um, to our upstate house and move back into an apartment that we both, uh, had kept, uh, that was rent stabilized. And we kept it because it was so cheap that anytime friends would come into town, you could stay there. Mm -hmm. So we, I said we could do that and have a really great summer and then see what happens on the other side. And that was the best move financially that, uh, and career-wise that we had uh, ever taken on, I think. That saved us and uh, made the quality of life better. Mm. We were able to ride the, the wave 
um, and get our feet back. And, you know, actually after each sort of, sort of catastrophic, uh, incident, our office has always come back stronger. And, uh, cause you know, you get, obviously I, I wouldn't, I don't really feel like going through those changes, uh, but uh, it's really cathartic. You know, you, you learn more about what you're about each time. You, you come back stronger, more determined. Uh, your for some reason our work gets better every time. Um, yeah. Well, was there a, a, a change in the types of projects that you wanted to be working on? Did you find that? perhaps residential or having all your eggs in one basket was risky or have you always kind of strived to have a diverse portfolio of work? So working with commercial clients, retail, hospitality, and private. Well, so back to strategy, I, I didn't, we didn't really have a strategy. We we're just trying to survive, trying mm -hmm. to build a portfolio of work. I, I, our goal was always about design. It was never about how we're going to get to, to where we think we should be. And I think what was most frustrating to us was that we were trained architects. I had worked for Richard Meyer, uh, Hanny Rashid, Liz and Couture for Asymptote, Peter Marino, uh, Toby had worked for Thierry Despont. Um, and we had worked on architecture before and, and living in New York and two transplants, me from the West coast, Toby from the UK, we had no family, we had no friends here. Um, so everything was from scratch. And because we're living in the fabric of New York city, primarily all of our work was interior architecture. So right. we, we really, that has always been the goal is how do we, begin to to obtain projects that are ground up projects and mm -hmm. in the beginning we used to do a lot of competitions um some hypothetical projects a lot of projects that we were engaged to do for, as second or third homes that would always be canceled or shelved during the process because being a second or third home it, it's not a a must have and there'd always be something that happens during the process. Mm -hmm. But after I think about in 2016, we started actually getting projects off the ground, um, residential projects. Um, so yeah, that's that now we've actually engaged a business strategist mm -hmm. to help grow the office and it, not, not to grow the office necessarily in size, but in diversity of project types. Oh, great. And, and what, what prompted that move to start working with a business strategist or strategist? That, well, so we've always wanted to work with someone, uh, to help us grow the business because that's not our forte. Our forte is design and, um, also we just, we didn't have time and we didn't, we didn't have the funds to, to what we thought was a luxury. <laughs> um, it's not really a luxury, but, uh, there are other things that were more financially important to us. Mm -hmm. So now at the moment we are in a place that, um, we felt it necessary and we have the funds. So we engaged an outside, uh, consultant. Brilliant. I, I, it's very interesting when practices start to work with these kind of strategic consultants and working on the business as it can kind of really broaden your perspective on design and, and where you want the business to go. Um, would you be able to tell us a little bit about the sorts of things that you've been doing with this strategist? What kind of, what kind of insights or um, new ways of viewing your business have, have kind of shown up, if you like? So it's way too early because uh, <laughs> we've only been working. I think I've met with the strategist twice, maybe three times. Right, okay. So we're just evaluating who we are, you know, and, and they are doing an evaluation of who we are, what types of projects we've done, 
you know, the matrix of where they think we would fit in well. Those are all things that we already knew. And um, it's great, but we they're now developing a plan mm-hmm. that we can implement to reach out to either a, a very specific potential clients uh, to broaden our uh, our network, and uh, that's that's something that. I, that's something we've always known, but we just, we never had, the, I don't have, just as a small firm, we don't have the time to do that. And it is mm-hmm. very important to do that, to, to not only sustain your practice, but to grow the practice in, in ways that you'd like to. I, I think also, it, you know, everyone has, everyone has a path that they take. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, I, I guess everyone always says it's not the, it's not, how you travel it's we all sort of get to the same hopefully get to the same place at the end so um sometimes it can seem very frustrating and i guess now that um the works the types of projects we're very happy with the book etc we're kind of in a place that feels probably for for the first time in a long time like um we can breathe and uh when even though I still feel like I'm like a kid inside when when younger architects come up to me and say, Oh, oh my god, I've admired your work for a long time, I, I look around to say who are you talking to. Um so I, I I guess we have reached sort of a point in our career where there's enough enough good work behind us that gives us a good foundation to to move forward in new directions. In the in the past, um, how has work typically come to you? Has it been word of, has it has, word, of, word, word of mouth and press? Ah, so so word of mouth and and the press and how have you how have you engaged with the press? So you know, I don't think this was a strategy, but more of you know going back to that, I always wanted my own firm, and Toby did as well. Is that I remember ever since, I guess probably since college um, when studying architecture, that I used to flip through magazines and books like they were porn. You know, like I was, I was in the library, you know, looking for the latest magazines, looking for the latest monographs. Um, when I went to, I didn't originally get into architecture school, so. Um, when I did get into architecture school, I was like super gung ho. And because my father's background and I knew how to draft, I, I knew a lot about design. I got into it very quickly. And, and also it just it clicked. It was like, Oh yes, this is, this is exactly what I've always wanted to do. So I don't know if it, maybe it's, it's probably ego that, I always knew like every time we would finish a project, like I wanted it photographed mm-hmm. and uh, documented. Uh, um, I remember working at Richard Meyer and partners and, you know, every project was documented from the time that the contract was signed with the contract with the client, you know, like sketches were on trace were like sealed in vellum or sealed in plastic so that it could be archived. And, um, you know, the whole process was documented and the final uh, project was documented and uh, every single project that almost every single project that we work on, we photograph in the end. So we, we put a lot of, put a lot of money into that. And, Mm -hmm. and simultaneously, you know, we were very lucky that each project uh, resonated with the press and uh, they carried those projects and people would either, you know, being in the press, it's not a one one to one situation where you get published and the next day, like you get twelve phone calls. Uh, a lot of potential clients earmark those projects, and maybe maybe in a year, maybe you know right away, maybe in two years when there's a when the project that they would like to work on um, comes to fruition, that that they then reach out to us. So we've had many clients who like 
come to us and say, oh yeah, we've been following your work for years. We, we now have the opportunity to work with you, et cetera. And then a, a lot of it is word of mouth. And now that after 26 years between press and between six degrees, maybe even now three degrees of separation, uh, that, that they either know us through someone or know of our work because through the press or someone. Was there a particular set of publications that you knew that you wanted to be featured in? And did you start working with the PR early on or, or, or were you kind of taking your own images to magazines and to editors and, and working it like that? Uh, so we are a small business and uh, Toby and I have done everything up until recently. I mean, cleaning the toilets, IT, bookkeeping, everything. So yeah, we were the ones who put together the PR package, reached out to all the editors, et cetera, which was actually a, a really good learning experience. Uh, and obviously we made a lot of good friends, but uh, now we are, we have a bookkeeper, we have IT, we have business developer, and we have a PR firm now because of the mm -hmm. book. So yeah, there's like, now there's lots of new people, lots of consultants adding to our mix. So t tell me a little bit about the, 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 the book, the monograph that's recently been published. How did this come about? And was this something well, that you've always been thinking coming, about? So it's just about yeah, to be released. Uh, yes. No, this is like from, like I said, back to college and lying on the floors of the library with books all over the place. Um, I remember like Aldo Rossi's monograph, Richard Meyer's monograph, Robert Stern's monograph, uh, um, Gwathmi Siegel's monograph. I had all those monographs and having a monograph published was a dream forever and having Rizzoli uh, publish was like the pinnacle of all dreams. So mm. uh, um, over the years, we've had many publishers reach out to us. Um, most of the time it was pay for play, which that path was not something that we were interested in. And not, uh, mostly because, so when you're published in a magazine, you don't pay to get published in the magazine. You're an editor dec uh, decides whether or not it's a good fit for their, their audience. Right. And, and mm -hmm. it's about validation of your work and not a vanity piece. So to, to, for us paying to have your book published seemed very like, Oh, we're just having a portfolio made and you're going to distribute it. So, um, out of the blue October of 2019, I think it was Rizzoli. Rizzoli sent me an email and said, Hey, uh, would you like to have breakfast? I said, sure. And, uh, we sat down and they said they would love to do, to produce a book for us. And I was like, wow. Yeah, that was pretty, that was a, actually, I said, wow, very, very meekly, but yeah, it was like, <laughs> wow, like firecrackers, whatever. Um, fireworks. Uh, so yeah, that was sort of like, wow. You know, I, I sort of feel like I think we are book signing is on the 21st of October. And I feel like I'm not one of these kind of drop the mic people, but afterwards I just kind of want to drop the mic and disappear because I'd be done. <laughs> um, but it, it's really just, uh, I'm hoping it's just the beginning. Uh, I mean, uh, from ever since being in architecture school, so I said that you're sort of mature when you're in your fifties as an architect. So I'm here in my mid fifties and, uh, ready to mature. <laughs> love it. Love it. Yeah. What, what's been the success, would you say between you and Toby? How have you managed? <laughs> you, guys, you guys have been working together. You've known each other since you were, you know, in your twenties or younger, even, um, twenties, in your early twenties, twenties, um, early twenties. So what's been the key to keeping that relationship creative, 
keeping it engaged, keeping it friendly. Wow. Uh, so, I mean, that's there's a lot there. So, Toby and I, Toby and I met, like I said, in 1987, something like that, and um, we actually both came out to each other. We're gay. Um, came boyfriends. I moved to New York. We we wanted to move in together. We wanted to find a place that was neutral ground because right. life couldn't be more difficult when you move away from your family and friends and you're just discovering that you're gay. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> what did we do? We we moved to New York City. Um, so we've been together yeah, ever since, um, but our relationship has evolved in many, mm -hmm. many ways. So we formed we were together, formed Masano O'Rourke. We were together, I think, for 12 or 13 years. And then we broke up. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm now married for since 2013 and with my husband, Drew, for 21 years. I met, thank you. I married Toby and his husband now, Roger, during COVID. I, I became a licensed... Uh, Amazing. Yeah, whatever. Um, married them during COVID. Uh, I'm uh, Toby's and Roger's uh, daughter's godfather. Um, we still have the business together. Uh, we are, and this has been from the very beginning, we, although he's mellowed out since... Um, <laughs> having now a four and a half year old daughter. Uh, but we're like an old couple. Uh, we design everything together. There's a lot of discussion. There used to be a lot more heated discussion. Mm -hmm. um, we are, I always call it sort of like, like we're playing poker. Like as we design, we sit together, we come up, with multiple designs, directions, and uh, we pick one that seems, pick one or two that seems more interesting. And we go back, either he, he usually starts to develop more of the design and then I, I've got a, other things on my plate and then we come back together. And I look at it and I say, oh, let's change this. Let's go to this direction. And it's just a, it's like we're constantly upping the ante. And then, as of course, as we bring in the other guys from the office, um, they all pick it apart. And uh, it, it's a good process. Uh, I think it's been a good process for 26 years. Uh, has it been kind of complementary skills? Or would you say that you're both kind of your skill sets are in the same place? They sort of are in the same place, but they're sort of not. So in terms of like the bigger picture, in terms of the office, we're both introverts. Um, I, I, I've i learned that I'm probably an extrovert in, inside an introvert's body. And Toby is just an introvert, introvert, introvert. And um, he doesn't deal with any, he doesn't go to any of the events, networking, etc. cetera. Um, so I do most of the front office stuff, but we design together. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that we somehow complement each other in many ways. In, in, it's, it's interesting as well. You were saying how you, you had a, a kind of, you, you were in a relationship together and then, and then broke up, and, but still managed to keep the business together. Because for many people, those two might be the same. That once, yep. if, the, if the emotional relation, if the relationship breaks up, then the business needs to break up. Right. How, how did you, that must've been really difficult, a difficult time. Well, I think that it was a, now, now we're getting into very personal. Uh, it was a slow process of breaking up. Um, yeah. It, uh, it wasn't like one day, like we're done. Um, mm -hmm. It was sort of a slow growth situation and you know we 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 have a lot of personal connection mm. and that still allows us to appreciate each other and also um 
we still have a lot of professional respect for each other. Mm. I mean, mm. I know it's, it's very unusual, but also I think now if I'm going to go down a d- different direction, I think being sometimes being gay, you know, especially at our, when we came out, it was for us a very scary time. We consider, you know, the definition of family, um, yeah. and I think has changed also. Um, mm-hmm. And I think as gay men, losing sort of possibly your family and friends because of being gay, you you develop new ways a new new ways of developing and understanding what family is. So mm-hmm. his family, he and his family are still my family, and mm-hmm. vice versa. So that was one of the reasons why I was difficult to break up because we were very concerned about how each family would take this on that it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't going to be a you know we hate each other and never want to see see you again um but maybe that would have been healthy too who knows (laughs) (laughs) and and i and i I suppose that everyone in the in the team as well was aware of what was of what was happening or not um maybe maybe not depending on who the person was um Mm. but it, it wasn't like we're not, we're very drama-less. <laughs> There's no, like, uh, I think we have, actually, we probably had more drama just about design um, and getting pissed off about design than anything else. And, you know, we also treat our office, and one of the reasons why our office is, has been small over these years, and I don't want it to grow really, really large, is because we are both very family-oriented. And so every mm-hmm. member of our team, we consider part of our family. You know, we're not interested in hiring someone for this project. Um, and when the project either ends or if it should end abruptly, then that person's let go. It's, it's a, you know, it's a long process of interviewing the right person, bringing them into the team and, and, and all of us being a part of, you know, a, a something larger than just this is a job when when you're bringing people into the office and and having them as part of the team how what does that process look like for you guys are you and do you do you actively um you know hire in terms of putting out hiring ads on that kind of stuff or is it people are finding you and you're bringing on talent when needed how does what does that look like for you guys so pre-covid it was the latter. So people would seek us out mm-hmm. during COVID is completely different. Uh, the work pool is very, very small. Um, it's a different, it's a different understanding about what work is, what your, what the employee is looking for, et cetera. It's been, it's been a, very, very difficult time during COVID. So work is extremely busy. Mm-hmm. Finding new team members has been extremely challenging. And uh, we have changed our, our hiring process has evolved as a result. And it's a three to four interview process. And it first starts off with Zoom, and then uh, there's two Zoom calls, and then there's two in-person meetings. Right. So it's it's quite a lot of FaceTime with the with a potential candidate. Yeah. You know, before it wasn't. It was one in-person meeting, and you knew right then and there, like it would mm. click. But this this time we're very, we're more discerning and. Are I think the potential employees? I don't. I'm not sure what they're looking for anymore. To be honest with you, yeah. Well, that that's very interesting. That's something that we've heard a lot. You know, when I've been speaking to other other architects, that the the job pool we know is is much harder in the last couple of years um, as a result of housing booms and not enough not enough talent and people's priorities particularly a lot of younger architects, their priorities perhaps have, have shifted and have changed of what it is that they're looking for and what they're, what they're wanting. When, when you're being more discerning, um, what does that mean for you guys? What sorts of things are a good fit 
and what sorts of things are like, you know what, this might not work? Well, I think number one is we're actually looking for someone who's self-motivated, who mm -hmm. is self-reliant. That um, not because we want them to be on their own, but we want someone who we want someone who's not just someone who kind of ticks off the tasks that they and we really push them to become more immersive in the entire not just the project but the whole office so that they you know working with people you know we want to give and we want to receive and it's very important for us that we're where we nurture and educate everyone in our office and hopefully they are bringing um they're bringing items to the table that improve our our work environment our lives our design process and we if we want whoever works with us when they leave to have more tools be better prepared for their next job than they were when they came to us mm. so for us i want them we want them to understand you know the entire design process client relationship consultants uh, management site supervision details design uh, everything and we're, we're never an office where and, and probably because we're small is like we don't ever hand someone a set of drawings and with a bunch of red lines and say start correcting um it's a uh, our process is is very like we start from the beginning and we're constantly adding new elements to the learning process so that uh, hopefully uh, you're always, you're always learning something new. Brilliant. And to conclude, what's, what's, what's the rest of 2022 and 2023 got in store for you guys? What are you looking forward to? Uh, I'm looking for, looking forward to, our book launch and we are um, giving a talk at the Victorian Albert on Monday, October 31st, which is, I think pretty amazing. Wow, uh, great. But yeah, thank you. But we have so much uh, at the moment, again, we're just in a really good place and we have a lot of great work at the moment and a lot of new potential work. And, and then there's always the unknown, <laughs> which is out there. So uh, I'm, just excited to be where I'm at at the moment and looking forward to the future. Amazing. Brian, well, I think it's a perfect place to conclude the conversation. Thank you so much uh, for your time this morning and for sharing us your insights and expertise and, and telling us your story. Thank you well, so thank much. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.